So if that happens, we lose. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and I am thrilled to bring you all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in episode one of The Last of Us. I'm going to break down the episode and the many similarities to the game, but don't worry if you've not played the game because I'm not going to spoil anything for you except this. Joel and Ellie are the core of this series and become very important to one another. That's not really a spoiler. Right? High five. Oh man, something in here smells terrible, and I think it's you. That can't be me, I just showered. With soap. Nah man, you smell like chemicals. My smells like 10,000 times better than yours, and you smell like Play-Doh and burning plastic. I can't work like this, I quit. Doug, no, come back, come back. Oh shoot, well I guess Doug is off the show because I smell. Anyways, so here we go. First, let's talk about what this show means and what it is trying to say. One thing that makes The Last of Us stand out from other zombie stories is that the zombie virus serves as the theme that drives the entire show. The Last of Us is about people losing their humanity and letting their primal violent urges take over their minds. So we see this in three forms. One, with Joel. He loses his daughter Sarah and becomes a hard man who doesn't think twice about pointing a gun at a kid or burning the corpse of a child. The zombie outbreak cost him his humanity. Second, and we see this theme expressed in the environment itself. 20 years after the outbreak, the civilization that humanity has built has been overrun by nature. In the show and in the game, we constantly see where the growth of nature has destroyed the works of humanity. And finally, we see nature conquering humanity with the zombie fungus itself. Now, it's important that the cordyceps fungus is naturally occurring. The fungus wasn't made in a lab or from an alien. It's a mutated being from Earth that threatens both human civilization and the human soul. And this process is expressed brilliantly in the opening scene in this talk show from 1968. I love all the little details here. The giant ABC network camera, the ugly brown ashtrays, the fact that everybody is smoking. If the people here look familiar, well, the scientist, Dr. Newman, is played by John Hanna, who played Holden Ratcliffe on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And the talk show host is John Brenner, a.k.a. Big Head from Silicon Valley. I love this opening for a few different reasons. One, it very calmly explains how this new zombie outbreak is going to work. Viruses can make us ill, but fungi can alter our very minds. And it tells us that the fungus will be relentless. The fungus needs food to live. While also letting us know that it will behave a bit like the undead zombies that we all know and love. It keeps its puppet alive by preventing decomposition. But also, they slyly blame humanity for the rise of the fungus by blaming climate change. What if... For instance, the world was to get slightly warmer. And this is when they stop framing shots like this as a talk show and film it cinematically. Dr. Newman is framed with a tight close-up as he portends the doom of humanity. There are no treatments for this, no preventatives, no cures. They don't exist. It's not even possible to make them. And that line, no cures, is meant to implant a kind of false despair because Ellie is immune and she could potentially represent a cure. And the ending line, so if that happens, we lose. Is just perfect. It elegantly expresses the entire theme of the show. Not just that humanity loses, but that Joel loses his humanity. God, I wish Doug was here. He'd have something to say about that. I'm back. Hey, you're here. I had to come back. Something in here smells great. It smells like coffee, shea butter, coconut. Wait, is that you? Yeah, it's me. I smell great. You know, I was never a person for buying fancy soaps, but then I found these all natural products that are made especially for men by Dr. Squatch, the sponsor of this video. I never even thought about why it's important for soap to have natural ingredients, but think about it. These are the products that keep you clean, and it makes sense that you wouldn't want them to be filled with harmful chemicals. Every ingredient in a Dr. Squatch product is at least 98% natural in origin. Like today, I used cold brew cleanse, and you can actually pronounce every ingredient on the back. We have oils of olive, sustainable palm, coffee grounds, coconut, shea butter. Yes, I'm getting all that, but also hints of kaolin clay. High five. Yeah, now compare that to the labels of most brands which are filled with synthetic chemicals. God, I wish you guys could smell this. It smells so good. Dr. Squatch has a wide variety of these natural products. They have soaps, hair care, deodorant, and more. And I'm telling you, when you shower with these soaps, you can feel the difference. Like this shampoo is called Cypress Coast, and it contains oat protein, jojoba oil, and honey. And you can eat it. No, don't. Don't eat the soap. You can't eat the soap. But Dr. Squatch does offer a super easy subscription plan, and they have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So if you want to try out 
out Dr. Squatch and support our channel, we have a special code for you. New customers can get 20% off on orders of $20 or more. Use my code DSQ Screen Crush and click the link in the description below. Now back to the Easter eggs. This show was created by Neil Druckmann and Craig Mazine. Neil Druckmann is the genius who created the Last of Us series at Naughty Dog. And many of us know Craig Mazine from his brilliant work writing Scary Movie 3 and 4. But I get up, 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 she's in Wach Howry. Person, he also created HBO's Chernobyl, a devastating and intricate look into another disaster of mankind's undoing. I know he made that, buddy. I'm just kidding. We all gotta start somewhere. The opening credits of the show are very similar to the opening of the game, except that they are in color. They depict the cordyceps fungus spreading outward, growing city-like structures to symbolize how nature is overpowering human civilization. The spreading symbolizes how the fungus spreads across our world and into our brains. And then the last two fungal growths are in the shape of Joel and Ellie. Now, in my mind, this is a perfect game adaptation. It keeps what works from the story, but also finds ways to expand on the story. For instance, in the game, Outbreak Day was in 2013 when the game was released but here it's been moved to 2003, so the show takes place in the present day, 2023. And this also means that we get some sweet 2003 Easter eggs and details that I'm going to cover as we go along. So the events of Outbreak Day are presented from Sarah's point of view, just like in the game where she is a playable character. Notice that her pillowcase has a butterfly pattern on it. That's a very important detail. Remind me to talk about it later on. You got it. Thank you. Downstairs, Joel asks about her homework. You get your uh, homework done. Which is hilarious and shows that he doesn't really have the time to be in her day-to-day life. This is kind of a callback to a birthday card that she makes him in the video game, which points out that he is never around. In the game and in the show, Outbreak Day happens on Joel's birthday. It's just that in the show, we're actually seeing the events that led up to the chaos that happened that night. Also, in both, Joel was introduced talking about his drywall job. Concrete guy's gonna be there? Yeah, they said maybe. Maybe. Tommy, listen to me. He is the contractor. And there are also little details that they've recreated, like Joel's acoustic guitar stand. Sarah also has a picture of a soccer ball in her room, and there's an actual soccer ball in the house. Tommy is played by Gabriel Luna, another alumnus of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. He played Robbie Reyes, aka Ghost Rider. Joel's Motorola phone is from 2003. I know because I had the same one. Man, you're old, person. Shut up, you're like two. Also, he says, But I'm on Atkins. Which is a no-carb diet trend from the early 2000s named after your mom. Later, we'll see that George W. Bush is the president which of course is another thing that occurred in 2003. Wow, 2003. It was a different time. When, <laughs> when she goes into his drawer, I laughed out loud because a lot of the gameplay in The Last of Us involves looking through drawers for scrap and reading notes that people left behind for their loved ones. Tommy's bumper sticker shows that he is a Desert Storm combat vet, which explains why he's so good with the rifle later on. Although I think he's a vet of the first Operation Desert Storm, not the second one that occurred in March 2003. Also, this also makes it even more sad when Tommy has to cut down his fellow soldier to save Joel's life. I loved how the outbreak is kind of slowly seeded throughout the day. Kind of like how before March 12th, 2020, you'd only kind of heard about the coronavirus in the background. Here, our first indication is the reflection of her classmates' watch, as the infection is causing them to lose their motor functions. See, all of these early reveals are either seen through windows or reflections to show that nobody is like looking directly at the outbreak, and it catches the world off guard. I'm going to point these all out as we go along. So, she takes the bus into the city, which is funny, because this was not even filmed in a major city. This was filmed in Fort McLeod in Canada. It's also where they filmed the town in Ghostbusters Afterlife. Now, they had to remake most of the storefronts for the show, except for Don's Barbershop, which is the same in real life. In fact, here's Don talking about this. Keep them coming. I, I don't see anything wrong with it at all. <laughs> Amazing. So, the watch shop is obviously filled with ticking clocks. The sound of a ticking clock is actually the first sound that we hear in the game. Now this is an indication that time is running out for the world. And obviously, Joel's watch is symbolic of this. Sarah was the good thing in his life. She kept him going. She was his humanity. Just like in the show, she repairs his watch. And when she's dead, the watch and time die with her. Outside, sirens go by. Another example of an outbreak occurring nearby, but through glass with the illusion of distance and safety. I like how at first we're made to think that she's selling the watch. After all, we also see her steal money from his drawer. And they have fun with this when she says, that's it. Okay, 30. 20's good. 
but it turns out that she's just surprised that it's such a cheap repair. Now, all of this is because Sarah exemplifies how the world existed in the past. People used to perform simple acts of kindness for one another. After the outbreak, kindness dies and everybody just struggles to survive. When Sarah enters the Adler's house, notice that we see the infected woman's face in another reflection, this time on a TV. Also foreshadowing how the first glimpse we get of the full pandemic later on will be on a TV set. It's very cool that even though the zombie outbreak isn't on TV, it's still on the TV. Oh, and by the way, when someone asks for your help making raisin cookies, this is the exact correct reaction. Chocolate chip? Raisin. And then we see another ticking clock, this time on the oven as the heat of the cookies begins to rise, symbolizing how the heating of the earth is about to release the cordyceps fungus on humanity. Sarah does the same thing that I do in people's houses. She checks out their DVDs. Now notice how this one says that there is an A side. This is actually something DVDs used to do, like my copy of Outbreak right here. Uh, one side is the widescreen version, and then the other side is the full screen version with extra features. Some of the movies she looks at are The Pink Panther and Murder Ball, a great documentary about wheelchair rugby, and also Breathing Fire, starring Golden Globe winner Ki Hu Kwan. Now, as she's looking, we get another shot at the outbreak happening in the background. God, this is the creepiest part of the entire episode. Yeah, man, it's half up. Now, her mouth is open because this is the fungus just beginning to hunger. And the only clue is the dog staring at her because he can smell this new life form forming inside of her body. Trust dogs, man. We, we, we know. Do I have any? Nah, you're clean. Whew, thank God. When Sarah exits, the sky is like this pale green color, like the color before a thunderstorm. Again, foreshadowing an impending disaster. Now the next sequence is a recreation of the game's great opening sequence, with Joel waking Sarah up on the couch. Except they sit on opposite sides, maybe to indicate that this is a mirror image to the game. Notice the ticking clock, another indication that time is running out. It's also a subtle foreshadowing of the zombies called clickers, who communicate with a kind of echolocation. <laughs> Much of this conversation is lifted straight from the game. Where did you get the money for this? Drugs. I saw hardcore drugs. Now the watch boxes are even identical and everyone is wearing identical wardrobes. Both Sarah's are wearing a shirt for a fictional band called Halicon Drops. So the movie they watch is called Curtis and the Viper 2. And this is an actual Easter egg from The Last of Us 2, where Ellie mentions that Joel loved a movie called Curtis and the Viper 4. What's Joel into? Uh, Curtis and Viper 2. Really cool how they repurposed his love of 80s movies in the show. Well, we used to watch these cheesy 80s action movies. He's really into them. So just like in the game, Tommy calls Joel, but in the show, the reason is more fleshed out and it's because he's in jail. Tommy being the troublemaker and a soldier foreshadows his life post pandemic when he is a member of the militant fireflies, but more on them in a bit. Just like the game, the first thing Sarah does when she wakes up is to watch TV. But in the game, there's a distant explosion on the television. The show saves this explosion for the moment after Joel kills the old lady because this is the indication to Sarah that the world has changed and her neighborhood is no longer safe. Joel also murders a zombie in the game. But first Sarah goes to the neighbors, which is a totally new sequence and scary as hell. The fungus growing from the mouth. Ooh. And this is like not even close to the most messed up stuff from the game. I wanna quickly also shout out the sound design in the show. If you watch with headphones or surround sound, there are lots of cool details, like how the sound changes when they enter the truck. Come on, come on, get in. This is just one way the truck sequence places us in a kind of first person point of view, which is we'll talk about in a second, mirrors the video games. So the next sequence is actually so close to the game that I'm not going to go through every single thing that is alike. There's the drive to the highway junction, the burning house, and of course, the way this driving scene mirrors the point of view in a video game. In the game, as Sarah turns around in the truck, the camera follows her, and this is also mimicked in the show. Even the dialogue matches up. Who do you think you're doing? Keep driving. Got a kid, Joel. So do we. Hey, Keep driving. Hey, but what they took from the game is not as important as what they have added. The show takes a lot more time to breathe, so characters can have dialogue about their situation. Like when Sarah realizes that she might be infected because she was at the Adler's, and she was also just in the city. You'd have to go a lot. Right. And her first response, Is it from terrorists? 
is also very 2003. It was a different time. You, you weren't born. A car accident also happens in the game, but the show added a plane crash. After the cut to black, the game's point of view shifts to Joel, and pretty much the same thing happens here. Before this, the camera was usually placed at Sarah's eye level, and in the back seat, when she turned, the camera turned with her. But now, the camera stays fixed at Joel's eye level, framing him for the rest of the opening. Also, shout out to our fellow video store right here, also in 2003. There was a very different time. Yeah, it was. So now, I did think that it was funny that they became separated from Tommy in different ways. In the show, they're divided by a large flaming vehicle, which is actually a much more common type of obstacle you would find in gaming than in TV shows. So everything with the soldier plays out exactly the same. It was heartbreaking that Tommy never tried to help Joel with Sarah's wound. As a combat vet, he would see right away that there was never anything he could have done for her. And of course, the shot also breaks Joel's watch, symbolizing how time basically stops for the world on the night of the outbreak. Clocks are also an indication of civilization. It's a way for us to conquer nature and measure time. But from now on, it is nature who's going to be conquering humans. Humanity. Then we go 20 years in the future as the camera follows another doomed child, this kid outside the Boston QZ. So, in the past 20 years, people have basically turned to tribalism. Cities have become fortresses and quarantine zones. Boston is run by the remnants of FEDRA, that's the Federal Disaster Relief Agency. But even though they were a branch of the U.S. government, they don't follow the U.S. Constitution anymore. Martial law has been declared, leading to public executions and suspensions of rights. This is why later on the Fireflies talk about, We are in a war against the military dictatorship to restore democracy and freedom to the son of our right. So this whole opening with the kid may seem kind of heartless, but this was actually a mercy. This soldier let the kid be happy in his last moments. And then we'll get you some new clothes and toys, as many as you want to play with. It's a harsh opening, but it shows the kind of world this is. Kids represent the future, and now humanity has no future. This infection chart seems to be a change from the games. Originally, it didn't matter where you got bitten, you would always turn within 48 hours. Joel burning the kid's body without remorse shows how, after Sarah, he doesn't really care about kids anymore. Like I said, later he actually points a gun at Ellie and would have absolutely pulled the trigger on her. Also, Joel's shirt, 100% game accurate. Now there are a few other vintage shirts that express how time has stopped, like this guy wearing a Desert Storm shirt and this fella with a Gore Lieberman shirt from their failed 2000 presidential campaign. And we see soldiers painting over the logo of the Fireflies. Yeah, you mentioned them. What are the Fireflies anyways? So the Fireflies are one of the tribal factions in America. As far as militant groups go, they're basically the good guys. They want to restore democracy, the constitution, and they want to find a cure for the outbreak by using Ellie's blood. The motto of the Fireflies is when you're lost in the darkness, look for the light, which we see painted here. And in Ellie's cell, the first part of the sentence is written on the wall, while Ellie herself represents the second part of the motto, looking for the light. The episode's title is When You're Lost in the Darkness because this is the starting point for this world and for Joel. Ellie even points out how bleak it looks outside the QZ. Look how dark it is. Because for Joel and the world, Ellie represents potential salvation. She is the light. I love all the little details to show how little people have here. Like how Joel sells the soldier drugs, but says, I need your bag back. Because they are not making any of those things anymore. And then we meet Joel's partner, Tess, played by the great Anna Torf. Now, if you've never seen her in the show Fringe, you are really missing out. Her performance in that show was criminally overlooked. The first time we meet Tess in the game, she's telling Joel the lie about getting jumped. And here we see how it actually all plays out. Another key difference is how the show made Robbie terrified of Joel. Now this is a great change because it establishes that Joel is a mean, violent son of a bitch. Da, 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 da. Also in the game, they're trying to get guns and not a car battery. But again, this is a great change because it means that Joel's primary goal is not to kill people, it's to go save his brother Tommy. And then we meet the live action Ellie played by the great Bella Ramsey from Game of Thrones. He's my king from this day until his last day. Now, we pointed this out in our Last of Us Explained video, but I think this is worth repeating. Ellie in the games is played by Ashley Johnson, who also played Chrissy Seaver on Growing Pains. And I was today years old when I found out that little Chrissy Seaver from Growing Pains also played the waitress in The Avengers. Now, since Growing Pains took place on Long Island, this leads me to believe that the events of that television sitcom are actually part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, since both the show and Marvel are owned by Disney. This is gonna be 
be a whole other breakdown video, I promise you, I might do in the future. Johnson is also in The Last of Us show, playing a woman named Anna who is described as a pregnant woman who must give birth under terrifying circumstances. But here's the thing. In the games, Ellie's mother was also named Anna, meaning that Ashley Johnson could give birth to Ellie in the show and in the games. This sequence might also explain why Ellie is immune to the fungus. Now, the guy running the radio is named Perry, and he is played by Jeffrey Pierce, who is also the voice of Tommy in the games. He sets Joel up on his hero's journey to save his brother, prompting Joel to later pour over some maps, something that you have to do a lot of in the last of his gameplay. Then the action shifts over to the Fireflies, and we meet Marlene, played by Merle Dandridge. She is the only actor on the show who is playing the same character she played in the games. And I know what you're both capable of. You're capable. And there is another actor from The Last of Us 2 who makes a fun cameo in this scene. This is your mom. As Joel and Tess ask around for Robbie, Joel is approached by a guy. If you're feeling lost. You tell me to look for the light and I'll break your jaw. So this dude is trying to recruit new members to the Fireflies by using their motto, do you want to look for the light? Because after all, literal Fireflies are lights in the darkness of nature. Remember, The Last of Us is about nature consuming the world of humankind, and the Fireflies consider themselves to be a light that can restore humanity. But maybe they're not all civilized. In the room where Ellie's being held captive, the camera lingers on the dried blood on the windowsill, implying that the Fireflies have done some brutal things to maintain power. Now, right here, they mention, was Riley a terrorist? Riley was Ellie's friend from the Left Behind DLC and the American Dreams comics. She will appear in episode eight, which will be a flashback to all that stuff. She dies three weeks before the show, after both she and Ellie were bitten. Joel and Tess going into the tunnels in between walls is another thing that is lifted straight from the games, where you have to constantly navigate through hidden doors and buried passageways. Then in the basement, this incredibly scary thing happens. Somehow Palpatine returned. <laughs> Sorry, I meant, I meant this happens. Now, this is one of the major differences from the game. In the game, the fungus is spread through floating spores that kind of look like the Upside Down in Stranger Things. The show did away with this because it would have required characters to like always wear gas masks, and it's hard to see the actors' faces. And I guess they didn't want to do the thing from Avatar where they just like CGI in the plastic. So in the show, the virus spreads differently, and I don't think we actually know how yet. Another difference is the death of Robbie, which was much more understated in the show. We don't see the big shootout with the fireflies, but then again, we don't have to. This scene is more about Joel, Tess, and Ellie. And more importantly, it shows how little they care for the kid. If not, we kill her there and then. Deal. Really? Marlene is actually shot in the same place in the game and show, and she makes the same deal with the smugglers. There's a team of fireflies waiting for her at the old state house. There's a crew of fireflies that'll meet you at the Capitol building. And the events from here play out the same, with both Joel's going to sleep. But the show adds a couple more details to thematically link Sarah and Ellie. Earlier, Sarah gently touched her father's knife, and Ellie's preferred weapon is a knife. Sarah had butterflies on her pillowcase, and right here, Ellie sits on a windowsill next to a butterfly. This wasn't in the game. They added this for the the show. This is a subtle nod to how Ellie could soften Joel's heart and allow him to once again embrace his humanity and his fatherhood. Now, the radio is also new, and the code words she finds are also very much like the game. You're always finding notes containing safe combinations and codes, so you can find items and unlock areas of the map. Later, when the three of them exit the QZ, events unfold almost exactly like the game. Even the dialogue is the same. Oh, shit. Actually outside. One difference is that there are two soldiers in the game, but the show keeps it at one, the same soldier that Joel did business with earlier. This is a great change because it makes this event more personal, but also it makes it more strongly mirror the events of Sarah's death. In the game, this is mostly implied, but the show is like just full of cuts between the two to show that Joel's PSD takes over the situation. <laughs> And then Ellie reveals her immunity as we cut to the radio playing Never Let Me Down Again by Depeche Mode. Now the song has a couple meanings. One, it can literally refer to Joel not wanting to let Ellie down the way he let down Sarah. And the lyrics of the song go, I'm taking a ride with my best friend. In this case, Joel and Ellie. I hope he never lets me down again. About Joel not failing Ellie like he did for Sarah. And he knows where he's taking me, where I want to be. Because Joel is leading her on this journey. Hey, doesn't that work the other way around too? Yes, um, it totally does. Joel is protecting Ellie on this journey, but she is also looking out for him. By looking after Ellie, Joel starts to redeem the death of Sarah. And maybe redeem all of humanity at the same time. Hey, are you sure I can't eat any of that Sarah? It smells so good. <laughs> no, Doug, you can't eat Dr. Squatch, but they do offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. New customers can get 20% off on orders of 
$10 or more. Use my code DSQ Screen Crush and click the link in the description below. But I want to know what you guys think of all this. Let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.